All right, I think we'll get started. There are probably some folks who are still coming in. Uh, I want to say good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to session three of the CAS virtual conference on closing the digital divide, access, instruction, and equity. My name is Bill Silva. I'm the Associate Executive Director at the Connecticut Association of Schools, and I'll be your moderator for today's uh, presentation, this third session, Creating Safe Learning Environments is our top priority, with guest presenter, Dr. Joanne Freiberg. No matter what instructional models schools are using, remote, in-person, or hybrid, it is paramount that we as educators prioritize the physical, emotional, social, cultural, racial, and ethnic safety of every student. While there are choices about the delivery of instruction, there is no choice about this top priority. Before I introduce Dr. Freiberg, let me remind you that this session is being recorded and will be posted on the CAS website so you can view it later and share it with colleagues, faculty, and staff. Uh, all audience members are muted during the webinar, but please use the chat to make us aware of any technical issues. And I'll also be monitoring the Q&A and uh, with as much time uh, as there's left at the end, Dr. Freiberg will address your questions um, towards the end. So now let me introduce our featured guest. Dr. Joanne Freiberg is a lifelong educator focusing on bullying, improving school climate, restorative practices, and character education. She has worked as a classroom teacher and as a teacher educator, and has held faculty appointments at Central Connecticut State University, Eastern Connecticut State University, the University of Hartford, and the University of Connecticut. Dr. Freiberg earned her PhD from Ohio State University and also has degrees from the University of California, Berkeley and the University of Alabama. For many years, Dr. Freiberg worked at the Connecticut State Department of Education. And since leaving the State Department of Ed, Dr. Freiberg formed school climate consultants, providing educational consulting services throughout Connecticut and nationally. Dr. Freiberg serves as co-chair of the National School Climate Council and is on the Connecticut Statewide Task Force on Sportsmanship. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Joanne Freiberg. Joanne, we look forward to your presentation today and to learning from you on this most important topic. Welcome. Thank you so much, Bill. And it's a real honor to have been asked to be with all of you today. And uh, so without any further ado, um, let's start. And I hope that this generates some interest and some questions and comments and so on. And um, we'll have time at the end, but please don't hesitate to ask a question through the Q&A. And if we can take it right then, we will. Otherwise, we'll deal with it at the end. So I think the bottom line, we all know this, is that safe schools means successful students. And with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, many children were and are still sheltering at home, which is a place that is not safe. And we're going to talk about safety, hence the asterisk. But safe schools means far more than physical safety. And right now, if you utter safety, everybody moves immediately to masks, face shields, sanitation efforts, distancing, hand washing, plexiglass dividers, and the list goes on and on and on. But the pre-COVID normal, because we now talk about this new normal, whatever that was, but that old normal was not safe for some students. And part of my role at the State Department was to receive the bullying complaints. And when I left about a year ago, I had crossed the 3000 mark number of unique cases. So I know probably better than anybody and all of you do as well, that so many children were not safe. They were chronically absent, they were shutting down, they were not coming, they were acting out and so on. So right now we have a serious challenge I believe it's a moral imperative and an awesome opportunity to create a new normal that is safe for each and every student and inclusive of each and every student. And when I'm talking about safety and inclusion, we are talking about physical safety, but also emotional, intellectual, racial, ethnic, cultural, gender, everything you can imagine. So I thought you might be interested in a um, and I always like to remind people that I am not smart enough to make anything up. I just try to read and synthesize as much as I can and put the pieces together for everybody. But there's a notion of institutional betrayal. 
And institutions like schools, churches, health and human services, and the military may inflict harm on people who depend upon them for safety and well being. In other words, whether this is intentional or most often unintentional, we are not as safe as we could be. So, institutional betrayal is alive and well here, even in Connecticut, but it can no longer be the elephant in the room. I mean, there's many elephants. But this is one of them, and I think we have to look very carefully so that our institution, our wonderful institution of schooling, is not betraying not even one child. So I, I, I kind of think about this, and I, I, I guess i am been around the block too often, but I wonder whether we've lost our way. Because pre-COVID, focusing on academics to the near exclusion of a child's social or emotional needs, have we done that? I mean. I, I heard, for me, horror stories about kindergartens in districts that were removing every vestige of play. And play is a child's work. And children are not just little vessels that we need to fill their heads with knowledge. They are whole people. They are social, emotional people. So emotional intelligence, human beings are creatures of emotion. I mean, that's who we are. That's how we're hardwired. That's our biology. And for several centuries until recently, the evolution of human thought has emphasized intellect and reason. Our culture has disparaged emotion as a weakness. And this is especially true for boys. Boys are not supposed to cry. They're not just supposed to show weakness and so on. It's part of our culture. An unpleasant reality that humans should strive to overcome with thoughtfulness and intelligence. I am reminded of a, an article that I read in my first year of my doctoral studies, um, which was called In Praise of the Cognitive Emotions. And it's always stuck with me by Israel Scheffler, philosopher of education, that we need to celebrate our emotional being, not just disparage it. So I think everybody here has seen the Castle Competencies graphic. And I just wanted to put it out there because when people talk about SEL, they parade this in front of everybody. Um, I happen to see social emotional learning, if you will, as really an outcome. We want children to be socially emotionally intelligent. And I think that is a goal we can all agree to. I think when we get into the weeds and say, well, what does it mean to focus on SEL? That's where we've had some problems with definition. And so here's my sort of jaded view. And I, I have the privilege right now of sitting on the statewide collaborative for SEL. We meet pretty regularly. And um, even among the 60 plus members of that collaborative, I believe that nobody has really defined SEL in the same way. It is defined differently by different people. And it almost seems, and this is the jaded part of me, so take it or leave it, to stand for anything not academic. You know, we got the academics over here and anything else we put in that SEL bucket. But I do see SEL as an outcome rather than something to teach. And I think that it's how we teach in the day to day that develops or hinders whether a child becomes socially, emotionally intelligent. So Maslow before Bloom. And we no need to know, and especially now, because there isn't a child or adult, we're all very fragile right now, need to have their basic needs met. And in many cases, kids are hungry, they're not sleeping well, they're being abused, and school was, for many children, the safest place they could be. And we sort of asked them to push that aside. Uh, most trauma-informed um, professional development is what I call highly sanitized. And I believe that we have to push that aside and talk about it so it hits you in your gut. Um, because we need to meet children's physiological safety and social needs before they ever can access Bloom's taxonomy. So since the beginning of our country in the 17th century, American schools have always had two goals, raise smart people and raise good and resilient people. I don't think there's ever been a choice to be made between them. I think they're both important. I think they've always been important. But if somebody were to pin me against the wall and say, make a choice, 
I would always say, I think we need to raise good and resilient people. And I think that's what's gotten lost. So if you think about definition of resilience from the original uh, researchers around resiliency, resilience can be defined as the capability to spring back, rebound, successfully adapt in the face of adversity and develop social and academic competence despite exposure to severe stress or simply the stress of today's world. And right now we have so many layers of stress I don't want to take time to mention all of them, but they keep getting greater and greater and greater, and we are all impacted. But resilience is not something you are born with. It gets built over time. So I think what we also need to understand is that raising good and resilient people, and in some cases, in some states, they talk about character education. Uh, we are not a state that mandates character education, but what it really means is raising good and resilient people is intimately and interconnected in an inextricable way with creating a safe environment. And I've always referred to that as school climate. So social distance versus physical distance. And I, I hope that this is something that might resonate with you because it's very important to me. We hear these terms used interchangeably. But I think we must be physically distanced, yet highly socially connected. And so I would hope that we would transform our language to refer almost exclusively when we talk about children being six feet away. That's the physical distance. But we have to figure out how we can remain socially connected. Because connection is the opposite of trauma, loneliness, and addiction. And there's a growing body of research that believes, as do I, one of the silver linings for me in this uh, pandemic has been that I've had the luxury of reading more than I do because I'm not driving as much. That trauma is the root, the root cause of all addiction. And we're not just talking about substance abuse, but other kinds of addiction. So I, I just thought I'd throw in here that there is some very, very well-established and validated research around the importance of children being connected to school. And there are five markers of connectedness. I had hoped a number of years ago when secondary schools were creating their student success plans that questions about connectedness would have been included in that uh, student success plan. It was not there at that time. I know that many schools have since uh, added that to part of this because it is so vitally important for child success. And I'm not just talking about um, personal success. I'm talking about academic success. Being close to people at school. Children should have friends, but every single child should have at least one adult that at any moment they feel they could drop anything, go to, and they would be there for them, for good, bad, questions, fears, joys, anything. Schools should be joyful places, and there is a growing body of research around the importance of having schools be joyful places, destinations. It is so vitally important that they be places where people wanna go. I think we should look at our chronic absenteeism numbers from time to time. Also, a sense of belonging is really key and important to a child feeling uh, that they are connected to school. Doesn't have to be the whole school. It could be a project, a class, a cohort, something that says, I'm here, I'm important, I'm valued, and I matter. The fourth thing, and these really are in no order, is that adults in school treat students fairly. And this is not about equality. And when we talk about equality, we mean that we give everybody the same thing. We're talking about equity, making sure that we're giving each and every child what they need. And when you start to peel back the layers around what constitutes fair, uh, fairness, it turns out that having a voice and being heard is so vitally important. And having a voice is at the root of what it means to work restoratively. We're gonna go there just briefly. And then finally, feeling safe in every possible way imaginable. Children who are highly connected to school do well. And to make this point, these graphs are scanned directly out of the original research. And for anybody who's interested, I, um, all of the, the information that I'm sharing with you today is grounded in a huge amount of research. 
Um, this is one of three studies that are summarized in PDF documents that I would be more than happy to share because this is information that needs to get out. But the, these graphs, and you don't have to be a high-end empirical researcher, I am certainly not, I'm a qualitative researcher. Um, the zero horizontal line is sort of a median or neutral level of connectedness. So in a gross sort of way, it's good to be below the line. I have added the blue letters just to contrast what we now know, because children who are highly connected to school um, do not abuse substances at near the rates as their disconnected peers. But children who are dealing with trauma experience far more substance abuse in attempts to self-medicate. And I pulled this out of the Hartford Current not quite a year ago in an article about pre-sexual abuse. Um, a Middletown attorney said he represented a young man who as a teenager was sexually abused by a priest. He turned to alcohol and drugs in an unsuccessful effort to ease his pain. And I think that um, Vincent Folletti, who is the uh, original adverse childhood experience co-principal investigator for the original CDC study, and I, I find this, you can linger on this uh, quote, it's hard to get enough of something that almost works. So if we look at emotional distress and suicide, ideology or ideation, attempts, completion, Highly connected kids experience far less emotional distress or suicidality than their disconnected peers. But traumatized children, oh my goodness, if you were to look at that data, it's off the charts, exponentially greater that children with trauma are um, thinking about attempting and completing suicide. Now, if we look at risky sexual behavior, same thing, highly connected kids, experience far less sexually sexual um, risky behaviors, but traumatized children experience far more. They're attempting to feel pleasure. And they, if you can't get high on life, they're gonna go somewhere where they can feel some pleasure. And then if you look finally at violent or deviant behavior, again, highly connected kids are experiencing far less violence, either on the receiving or the dishing out end or deviant behavior but traumatized children experience more. And we now know why they experience more violence or deviant behavior, because children with significant stress or trauma, and it doesn't take a whole heck of a lot, that's when you start to see changes. And in schools and community settings, children walk in the door nearly 33 times more likely to have learning and behavior issues. They act out, call out, run out, hit someone near them, can't pay attention. These are the children with impulse control problems. They have difficulty regulating behavior. And all of us know that in the pre-COVID era and for decades and centuries before, Fridays and Mondays are the worst day for behavior. And we know why now, because these are children who have to cycle from the relative, and please emphasize relative common safety of school, to crazy town, their homes, where many of them are now um, sheltering. And I borrowed that phrase from a wonderful book called Help for Billy, written by Heather Forbes, who's a licensed social, work, social worker. So here's what we have to do. We have to make sure that our environments, and I am talking about our physical environments and also our virtual environments have to be physically, emotionally, culturally, intellectually safe. They must be predictable and consistent. No surprises. They have to have very clear, understood and expected routines. So I think that we do have a very clear moral and practical imperative because how we operate, how we teach, how we design our, our classrooms from what's on the walls to how do we talk to one another and so on, that matters. And when our little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it's our job to share our calm, not to join in their chaos. And right now, I, I'm, I think we're all hard pressed individually to find calm. And so this is even a bigger challenge for all of us. So Gabor Mate, who's a, a physician, he works up with addicts in the Vancouver, Canada um, area, has written a fabulous book called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. And this is where he, among others, 
very persuasively with science um, advocates that all addiction is rooted in trauma. But when we look at bad behavior, and we can talk about destroying a room or hitting somebody next to somebody or breaking a pencil, let's just take this from the very little things to the very big things. Gabor Mate says it's not bad behavior, it's behavior asking for help. So what's really going on with children with trauma? First of all, the neocortex, and I am not a scientist, I said before, I'm a philosopher of education, but 76% of our brain is the neocortex. And that neocortex, which really is not even 1% of it exists when a child is born, but the space in the head does, if you list a baby's arms over their heads, the whole arm lifts to about the top of their skull, whereas so that they can grow into their brain that will develop. Whereas if we lift our arms, you notice it goes up to our elbows. But that neocortex is responsible for language, cognition, and motor commands. It's called the executive functioning portion of the brain. And I listed here in quite a long list of detail what executive functioning skills are. And when children are experiencing trauma, their neocortex does not develop normally. It is delayed. And so very often, whether it's a 10-year-old with a three-year-old neocortex or a 15-year-old with a six-year-old neocortex, very often we are asking children to do tasks that a normal child would be able to do. But these are children who walk in the door almost 33 times more likely because they don't have these executive functioning skills that their, that their peers who have grown up in safe and caring environments do. So this is one of the, the sort of bodies of research that we really have to come to grips with because somehow down the line, we got the impression that children who behave badly should be punished. And in schools, this is exclusionary discipline. Detention, suspension, in or out of school, privilege denial, and so on. And I dare anybody to show me research that says that works to change behavior positively because it doesn't exist. Years ago, when many of us were growing up, we didn't have the landscape we had. We didn't have social media. We didn't have so very many things that have changed our institutions. Because when I was growing up, schools, my teachers, and my parents were the most important adults in my life. And that was true for so many of us. So if I misbehaved before I ever got home, and that was a five minute walk, I grew up in the West Coast, that was a five minute walk before I ever got home. My parents knew about what I did and I was cornered and shamed between those two bookends of people that were the most important people in my life. And I changed what I did, not because of the punishment, but because of the relationships. So what the, it's never worked, but now we know it's, you're not my mother, you can't tell me what to do. It's just not working at all. So what I would say to you is that the research around punishment, this is what it shows. It increases children's stress. It diminishes adult to child relationships. It does nothing to teach more productive skills. It labels the very children who need caring relationships in a safe environment it normalizes and confirms a life of toxic stress, of trauma. It confirms that adults really don't care about them. It doesn't get to the root of the problem and it perpetuates the cycle of traumatic adversity. Now, let me also say, um, just in passing, so we know that you know if a child suffers with um, academic delays, they need more support, we do everything we can. We don't get to a point where if they're not multiplying by seventh grade, we say, okay, you're done with math. You never have to take it again. And oh, by the way, you're out of here for a week. 
We would never do that with a child who struggles academically. We have to think about social, relational, behavioral skills in the same way. If they don't have them, they need them, and they need more and more support so that they gain those skills and tools. It's no different. All right. So the solution rests in creating classrooms that are what we might call restorative. And if you look through this list of, of sort of descriptors of what it means to be in a restorative environment, there's a lot of myth around restorative. And um, when we do training around restorative practice, we do an awful lot of myth busting because so much of what is out there in the name of restorative practices is not. And if you look over this list, I don't know about you, but I'd like to be in this kind of environment. So, thought this might be helpful. And I think that, um, I, I think I saw a question out there, Bill, would this uh, set of slides be shared? And I'm more than happy to share it. So I will send it to you and you can post it because I know it has a lot of information in it. And I, that's my style. I try to make it quite meaty. This is a um, sort of chart of what the difference between what we might call a retributive perspective versus a restorative perspective. And when I say retributive, that's, you know, a pseudonym for a punishing kind of environment. And schools, I mean, we come by this honestly, we really do. That's what we've done for years. We've translated it into student handbooks and we work for, for months and months, sometimes years, to imagine every possible misbehavior possible and tie it to some kind of um, consequence. Let me tell you, the 3,000 call that I received at the State Department about how one child hurt another was a new one to me. I, there is an infinite number of misbehaviors and they cannot be quantified. So this is a total waste of time, much less it doesn't help children. But in a retributive environment, and I'm again, I will share this so I don't have to read everything, but we really are focusing on rules and guilt or innocence and punishment. And it's a purely rational approach that doesn't include the victim or victims or the perpetrator in solving the problem. Whereas in the restorative world, and please hear me out, there are no fewer rules. There's just as many, maybe more rules, but we're not looking at the rule being broken. We're focusing on the harm that's done in the breaking of the rule, and then we're going to fix it. And we want to make sure <clears throat> that whether it's a person or property, that harm is recognized, those needs are heard, and the offender is encouraged to take responsibility and be a part of making it right, fixing it. And this is much, much harder than just doing time. It's more impactful and it really does change the circumstances. This is how and when individuals become socially and emotionally intelligent. They can develop empathy, they can make it right, and this is where we need to go. This is where the research shows there's impact and we can make a difference in, in individuals' lives. So again, let me bust some myths. When you're working restoratively, a child, an adult, whomever it is, is always held accountable. Always, always, always. Children may need some chill time, like we need to separate you guys, but they don't need to do time. And I like to say it that way, but that's the exclusionary uh, discipline piece. Because the accountability is making amends. Apologizing, that's like, the first thing, making amends, repairing, restoring, and sewing. And doing that is much, much harder than just sitting out. You learn nothing that way and you just get angrier and angrier. So at its core, working restoratively is about building relationships and community, providing high expectations. It's my little graphic down here, general patent, and the support necessary to meet those expectations. That's Fred Rogers. They need both, not just for some, but for all, child and adult alike. And we have a moral and practical imperative to work this way from this moment forward, if we haven't been already. 
So <clears throat> I've come to learn that restorative practices is actually a pretty unfortunate label because most of the work is not about repairing or restoring anything. It's about building, forming, and transforming that community, those relationships, that climate. Because if you don't build it, there is nothing to repair. So I think everybody and anybody who has seen a workshop that I have provided has seen what I call as my very famous bubble slide. And I don't know about you, but as I move into my fourth decade as an educator, I have grown to loathe triangles in education. I think we do far more with multi-tiered systems of support and categorizing children into tier one, two, or three than we need to. But having said that, because of the proportions here, I'm kind of stuck with this beautiful little uh, isosceles triangle. Shout out to the mathematicians out there. Anyway, um, you notice that there are bubbles in the background. And the reason why there are bubbles, it's that people are like bubbles. We share space. We're just in and out and talking and moving in an area together and so on. And those bubbles just floating around sharing space represent what I call as the 80%. I don't know if it's 80, 78, 83, I don't know, but it's the majority. And there is nothing restorative about building a positive community and high quality relationships. This is formative and transformative. But if you don't build it, when those bubbles bounce into one another and move in opposite directions, and that's an inevitable part of life, if we don't have a solid foundation, we can't repair anything. And the same thing, when those bubbles burst because the, the harm is so great, we still can repair it again if there's something to build on. So let me paint some pictures because I'm a pretty visual person. And I, I, again, I think it's important to bust some myths around what restorative practices really are. I just spoke about the metaphor of building a strong house. If you live in a strong house, and we've had so many storms and storms are raging everywhere. If a tree falls on your house, damages the roof, breaks a window, if that house is standing and strong, we can repair the roof or fix the window. But if there's no house and a tree falls, there's nothing to repair. Now, I like to think about becoming restorative because re working restoratively is not a program, it's not a curriculum, it's a philosophy, it's a framework, it's the biggest umbrella I've ever seen in my professional career. I think that you grow to become restorative. You just like an infant becomes an adult. When we wake up in the morning, we can't choose to be 10 again. We can't, we're adults. But once you realize what it means to live as a restorative person, to create a restorative um, classroom or home or community, you don't go back because it's such a better place to be. But I think the final uh, bullet here really describes what this work is about. And I hope that maybe this will help if you had any questions about what working restoratively really means. I call it working from the family model. Because in families, children are really, siblings can be best described as being frenemies. Sometimes they can't get enough of each other and at other times they're at each other's throats. And sometimes you watch them playing so beautifully on the carpet, you go into the kitchen to fix dinner and you hear screams and you race out and somebody's biting somebody else and pulling somebody's hair and scratching. And if you don't separate them, chill time, they may not make it alive till dinner. But at the end of the day, whether we do it well or we do it poorly, we always bring people back together because we're a family. That's the way it works. You don't go over to the shelf and pull off that very worn and torn um, family handbook, turn to page 63 and go, oh my goodness, that was really bad. That, that, that's three days out of the family. We don't suspend out of families. And in schools, we have not embraced that model. What we've done when an angry parent calls is say, because that parent wants blood. They want that six-year-old drawn and quartered and shipped out forever. They want the child removed from the class, out of the lunch wave, not on the bus, lockers in completely different areas. And usually, historically, we've done that, thinking that the problems will go away. But that is not what we need to do. We have to embrace the family model. We have to say, yeah, that's going to happen, but 
we need to bring people back together. And in all of the calls that I would receive over the years, 14 years, by the way, um, I would do more education. And when parents called me and say that school isn't removing the child and changing the buses and so on, I would say, what's your goal? What do you really want? And they would say what they wanted was for the behavior to stop and they wanted their child to be safe which is the right thing. And I would say, well, if that's what you want, good for you. What you're asking for is not going to get there. And so most parents get it. If you start talking to them about the family model, they get it. So this work is a real journey, but the train has left the station and we have to start and help adults get the tools. I think that's the main reason why we don't work restoratively. We don't have the tools. So in restorative practices, they have something called the fundamental hypothesis. And if you can't embrace this, you can't work restoratively. Because again, restorative practices is not just about disciplining different. Take that thought away. Yes, it is. But it's most importantly about this. Because human beings are happier, healthier, healthier more cooperative, and most likely to make positive changes in their behavior when those in positions of authority do things with them rather than to them or for them. I hope that makes some intuitive sense. So this translates into something called the social discipline window. It has two scales. The, the horizontal scale is about support in a family. This is love, nurturance, caring, food, shelter, clothing, hugs, trips to the doctors, material, emotional support. The vertical side, they call, they call control. I like to think about them as expectations. In a family, chores, boundaries, how we treat one another, bedtimes, meal times, what you can eat, when you do your homework, how much television or computer time you, you need, and so on. And when you put those two scales together, you get these four boxes. So let me recite the fundamental hypothesis once again while you're looking at this so that you can understand, and this is not a training, this is even less than an overview, but I really thought that folks should understand what the pathway to success is. So human beings are happier, healthier, more cooperative, and most likely to make positive changes in their behavior when those in positions of authority do things with them rather than to them or for them. And I can tell you, I have a four minute video, I'm not gonna show it today, that we use in training, where you will know exactly what each one of these boxes is like. And I can show it to middle school students and they can tell you exactly which teacher is punitive, permissive, neglectful, or restorative. This is not tough to wrap your heads around. And usually as educators, we're all over the map. We're having a bad day. We tend to be barking and more punitive with kids. We go home, we feel bad about it. So the next day we let them get away with stuff, thinking on balance, that's all right. Then we don't sleep one night and we just say, do what you want. But the goal is to live up in that restorative box. And it sounds like this. Here are the expectations. What support do you need to meet them? Very simple. And so working restoratively is having very high expectations, clear, many of them, but saying, what kind of support do you need so that you can meet those expectations? Every child has to meet them, but every child needs a different level of support. So this is not the trajectory because so many people erroneously believe that if you aren't punishing, you're doing nothing. And that is so wrong because there are worlds of restorative consequences between that island of punishment and that world of doing nothing. So remember that uh, castle graphic that we all parade around and say, this is what we're embracing? Okay, let's make sure that we are helping children develop social and social emotional competence. But that will not happen unless it's done inside a restorative world because the role modeling and the teaching and the environment matters. So if we want to be successful at raising socially, emotionally competent children, we have to first and foremost create an environment that's restorative. High expectations, but the support necessary to meet them. So I wrote a little op-ed 
and I'm happy to share that too. I think uh, we, we sort of created this webinar, if you will, around that little op-ed I wrote. Um, and I thought I'd pull a couple paragraphs from it because I think it's a really good way to summarize what we're really talking about because I, I wanna pull it back to no more institutional be betrayal. No matter what models schools open with and evolve into, it is paramount that each and every educator and those making the decisions about all this prioritize this emotional, social, cultural, racial, and ethnic safety, as well as physical safety of every student. This is our moral obligation. Not only will all children th thrive, but those who have experienced physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, neglect, or racial trauma will experience respite from their unfortunate circumstances and they too will be able to thrive. There are choices about the delivery of education. There is no choice about what our top priority must be. And I, I wish I could have the time um, to share with you the vast body of hit you in the gut research around trauma. But these children who are experiencing trauma will become statistics if we don't do exactly this. So, Thought I'd end with a couple um, pretty telling bits of data from our state, and then we can open it up if that's okay. So this is from Northwestern Regional High School up in Winstead. And it didn't take this long, but I received the uh, email uh, a year or two ago. So just think about this. In the 2011-2012 year, our high school had chronic absenteeism of 23.7%. With intention, we focused our efforts on improving our school climate and implementing restorative practices in our way of being. Positive relationships were at the heart of everything we did, and we focused on people over problems. Our administrative and school counseling offices became areas of refuge, places where students came to proactively problem solve situations, and this shift had a major effect on our attendance and learning. In the 17-18 school year, our chronic absenteeism had dropped to 3.1%, and our high school was honored as a high school of distinction for academics in the state. Now this is far more recent. Um, I have the privilege of working with two middle schools in Stamford as really pilot schools for the district. And this is Ripawam Middle School. And in the fall of last year, the COVID year, as reported by teachers, a total of 157 children were not connected to an adult. So between then and a few weeks before schools were closed, that number had dropped to 40 because with intentionality, those educators were making sure they were connecting with kids. And this is the effect. There was chronic absenteeism in that 18-19 school year of 16.5%. And in the 1920, just last year, and, and Matt Laskowski, the principal, said it was really lower than that, dropped more to 5%, but let's use the 9.7% at the midpoint of the year. That's still pretty drastic. And also, in the 18-19 school year, they had 275 out-of-school suspensions, and that dropped to 35 right before the um, schools were closed. And he said that was going to be zero this year. Of course, here we are now. And it's not that they were just saying to everybody, we're not suspending kids. That used to be the old way, just to tell people, don't suspend so our numbers will look good. They were handling them restoratively, truly restoratively, not just sending them down to the office, you know, throwing around a teddy bear, making, forcing an apology, giving them a lollipop and sending them back to class. It, that is not restorative. That is so not restorative. They did the hard work and it was making a huge impact. So that is where I decided to end today, which leaves us with not quite 15 minutes to ask questions, open mics. I don't care, Bill, you're not, turn it back to you. And I can oh, stop sharing if you like. Should I stop sharing so we can all see the, or leave this up? Uh, you can leave it up, because uh, 
th th this is the most uh, anyone can see anyway. So, um, well, thank you, Joanne. That was just such a terrific presentation. And uh, as many times as, as I've heard you speak um, and have worked with you and have gone to trainings with you, just your passion and your uh, devotion to this subject matter and to school climate and uh, restorative practices and, and safety of the school environment for all students is just uh, just comes through so loud and clear. So one thing I wanted to ask is, as we wait for some other uh, questions to come in, um, and, and I was thinking about the slide you had that had, you know, the retributive uh, characteristics on one side and the restorative on the other. And as I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, uh, we seem to live in a culture uh, that is more retributive uh, than restorative. And just to kind of reflect on that in terms of how challenging this work can then be, because oftentimes you're really trying to change the model or the mindset that you know, people have just grown up with. I mean, uh, you know, you look at our, you know, prison system or our system of justice and, and so much of it is based on that retributive model that um, it's no wonder that it's, it's hard sometimes to get people to think in a different way. Um, well, let me just say that I think that it does, that may be one of the biggest challenges, but when folks get the information, I mean, adults don't know what they don't know. And one of the lines from restorative training is view resistance as fear. How could you do something if you don't have the tools to do it? And that's what training is all about. And I would encourage anybody, and, and I will say, again, I'm jaded, but I hear a lot about folks who've gotten training here or there or whatever. And, and what I find is that the focus of restorative training tends to be on the disciplinary piece. And, and I, they're not as successful as when you really look at this holistically and focus on the environment and the climate in which you're doing this. And I think once people get that it, this is absolutely uh, an imperative, moral and practical, we can't wait any longer then we can move forward. So uh, I like to say this train has left the station. It is a journey. And um, I like to quote The Hobbit. You know, it's a dangerous business walking out one's front door because you do encounter people who have such deep roots on the island of punishment that um, they are reluctant to leave, but they have no other place to go. If all you do, if the only tool in your toolbox is exclusionary discipline, how can you be expected to do anything else? And I think success breeds success. And when you have, a, in a typical faculty, when we are able to train an entire faculty, you will have you know, 95% of people going, oh my goodness, I get this, this is great. And they do it. And then you give more support to the 5% who need it, and you show them the success and so on. This is not gotcha, because here's the rub. You have to train and you have to work with people from that restorative con uh, quadrant. You can't do it to them. So it's about allowing them to understand that their reluctancy is a matter of not yet having as much support as they need. So I, I think that's, um, that is absolutely a key piece, but we can't wait. Right. Uh, so one other thing that I've, I've been thinking about is, you know, and you make very clear that the importance of connections and every student should, you know, have a, an adult that they can, uh, you know, feel that they can speak about w with anything, whether it's a problem or a challenge or a question that they have. And I'm just wondering in a, either a virtual environment or even the hybrid environment, I would think making those connections, especially if you're starting the year that way, is going to be uh, harder to do. And what what kind of guidance or advice could you give to teachers in terms of, you know, how, how to uh, reach out and try and make those connections given the uh, circumstances that they might be uh, having to teach in with each, either a virtual or the hybrid where they're seeing maybe students for, you know, for one week and then not for a week or having them in class on certain days and not on certain days and any thoughts you have on that? 
Yes, I mean, first of all, just to be crystal clear, that positive relationship with an adult is in school, okay? I mean, what they yeah. have in homes and communities is icing on the cake, but we're talking about in school. And I'm gonna quote my um, wonderful colleague, superintendent of Stratford Schools, Janet Robinson, who said on the uh, SEL Collaborative uh, earlier this week, she has informed or is relentless with her teachers that we're gonna go academic light and, and focus on prioritizing relationships and getting to know one another. That we're starting to get sort of uh, word out from, from what's going on in schools. And so many kids are coming back saying, I don't have any friends in my cohort. My friends are not in my cohort. And so children have to create relationships with one another and with the adult if they ever expect to do any kind of learning. So I would make sure, and I'm not saying don't teach academics, that's not the point, but I would make a point of focusing on get to know you and starting every uh, session in person, whatever, with something fun. Classes have to be joyful, they have to be, um, they have to be places where people feel they can share honestly and so on. So I would highly recommend that, just like they said at Northwestern Regional, we prioritize people, we prioritize relationships. And when we start to ask us that, when you ask, when you do, when you work restoratively, this isn't a recipe. This is about each and every one of us and figuring that out. If anybody specifically has questions, I'll answer that for their own context. I'm not trying to avoid the question, but I'm just trying to suggest that um, yeah. we have to put that as a priority. Now, I do see there's a question here. Yeah. So the question um, about uh, what's the where, what's the starting point? Where 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 does one begin? Well, I think. My, my colleague and I think that the best place to start is by uh, providing the landscape of why this work is so urgent. So when we're asked, we generally suggest that we do some kind of overview presentation, which, you know, you tell me how long you have. Again, this isn't canned. We'll do it in 45 minutes. Better if we have two hours. But where we present this hit you in the gut research around trauma, and then we tie it to working restoratively. And once you do that, most educators will say, oh my goodness, help me do what I need to do. And so I think that that's a really useful place to, to start. And then um, start to get trained. Uh, what we've done, and this happened on a dime because I did it through the state, um, as, as well as doing it out of state, and uh, now we do it virtually, where divide up uh, two days worth of training into 10 hours worth of virtual training. In some cases, we're doing it in one hour segments, in some in two hour segments, in some in two and a half hour segments. We'll work with you, but I think you have to get the right kind of training and all you have to do is contact us. Um, I think that it's, it's imperative that um, people get trained because if you don't get trained, you don't have those tools. And you can read a book, but you know this is not something you pull off a shelf. The wisdom is within the faculty and staff of, of, and strategies. I mean, yes, there are concrete strategies about language that you use and, and how you organize the classroom and what it means to provide high expectations and support. I've done none of that today, none of that. But, um, I think you start by getting people excited and understanding what they really have to do. Mm -hmm. Make you a better parent, person, educator, and so on. I hope that answered it. Yes, I think so. So I, I guess, uh, you know, one of the points you made early on was that, uh, you know, w w well before the current circumstances we were in, um, you know, students e e either at home or, or at school or, or in both places might have been feeling unsafe. And um, so, and, and I think you've addressed very uh, well in terms of that priority of making schools a safe place. So how, how do we 
kind of, uh, especially with students who may be spending more time at home because they're all virtual or hybrid. I mean, how do we begin to help make those safe places as well? Um, and Well, what we know about trauma is that um, historically it's been social taboo to talk about. For example, if we receive a new student into a school, we have no problem saying, oh, where were you before? And how many schools have you been to? But we're not asking kids if they have enough food at home, if somebody's crawling into bed with them at night that shouldn't be, if they're being awakened at night or if they're sleeping in a car. Um, Vincent Folletti, I had the privilege of hearing him about five years ago, and he talked about this as total social taboo. And what is going on now in uh, most trauma-informed practice training is we have perpetuated that and we do sort of trauma light. So people sort of get a sense, but what um, we have created is a hit you in the gut um, kind of training that really is jaw dropping because it honors exactly what's really going on. We look at the original research. We look at the adverse childhood experience study. We look at the markers. And then once you know what they are, you can start listening for them, informally screening kids, but just talking about these issues, you know, all you have to say to a group of kids in a cohort, what happened to you in the last six months? You will start to hear things that you have never heard before. We just don't want to ask. Mm -hmm. So we have to start these conversations and not be afraid of them. I, I, just as a little anecdote here, I think at this point, um, we have addressed probably I don't know, five to 10,000 adults with this trauma training. And not one time, not once has somebody come up to us and said, why'd you make me do this? This was a waste of time. We walk in, everybody's had trauma-informed practice training and not one person has said, wow, um, I could have done something else. I'm just telling you, we, we can't, we have to be, I mean, sort of the tone of what I'm saying, I'm in your face because I don't think we can wait any longer. That's... Well, uh, Joanne, this has just been such a wonderful presentation and uh, just monitoring the comments in the chat. I know our audience feels the same way and you know, you've made the point and it's been made by other uh, speakers during our other sessions today about this priority of students feeling safe, students feeling connected, because if that's not happening, then learning is not going to happen either in in, in any format. If we're not getting students to, to be there, to be with us, to, and to be there in a way that uh, learning can happen, then um, you know, that, that first priority hasn't been taken care of. So thank you so much. You've given us so much to think about. Uh, again, your example through the work that you've done, you've given your career to this, and uh, I know it has made uh, schools in Connecticut better places for students, uh, and I know this work will continue, and it needs to continue, as you say, um, we, we don't really have a choice. So thank you, I wanna thank our audience as well. I wanna remind folks uh, that we have two other sessions uh, coming up. Uh, if you haven't registered, you need to do that, but you still can do that. Um, and uh, we are recording this session, and it will be made available, and uh, Joanne's you know, graciously said that she would share her slides with us and and so we will make those available uh, as well through the CAS website. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to thank everybody. Joanne, one more time, thank you. Uh, CAS uh, always uh, loves having you uh, present and you've been such a loyal uh, friend to us and we're very happy that we're able to uh, be the vehicle for sharing your expertise and your wisdom with our listeners. So. Have a good rest of your, your day, folks. I hope you'll join us. Our next session is at 1.30, and then we have our final session at three o'clock. So uh, have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.